not everyone's meant to like bench press. I don't think. I think especially as you get older, you know, it might be tough on the shoulders, the joints. And if you can find a better way to maybe utilize different tools in the weight room to help with joint integrity, I think resistance bands is something that I never used to use. And now I use it from time to time and it's effective. Welcome to the Wits and Weights podcast. I'm your host, Philip Pape. And this twice a week podcast is dedicated to helping you achieve physical self mastery by getting stronger, optimizing your nutrition, and upgrading your body composition. We'll uncover science backed strategies for movement, metabolism, muscle, and mindset with a skeptical eye on the fitness industry so you can look and feel your absolute best. Let's dive right in. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. Today I'm speaking with Brian Grin author of The Stepladder System, and the go-to guy for men over 40 looking to turn their health around. I brought him on the show because we are kindred spirits when it comes to no-nonsense, practical fitness and nutrition advice. And today, you are going to learn his six steps for rebuilding your strongest, healthiest body over 40. Brian's going to show you how to find clarity, tackle stress, and make sleep your secret weapon for fat loss and muscle gain. We'll get into nutrition myths, meal timing, and intermittent fasting, plus effective strategies for training smart, given your recovery capacity and joint health. Brian is one of the good ones in the industry because he cuts through the noise, he avoids fads and quick fixes, and he gets real results. He's been in the health industry for almost 20 years, coaching middle-aged men on how to build strength and healthy habits that they can use for the rest of their lives. With a background in functional diagnostic nutrition, Brian creates no-nonsense, customized plans that give you more energy, a stronger body, and a sustainable lifestyle. He's in the business of making health transformations tangible, focusing on what really works over the long term. For men over 40 seeking a serious reboot to their health, including more energy and strength while losing inches, Brian is the real deal. Brian, welcome to the show. Philip, thank you for that introduction. (laughs) I'm going to have to (laughs) copy-paste that onto my podcast. (laughs) I'm happy to give it to you, man. I, I might have to take that from you. Thank you. You got to have the uh, epic Avengers music behind it, you know, that really wraps it up. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. For sure. And we met on your podcast and you were gracious enough to come back on here. What we wanted to talk about today was these six principles from your book. And I want to let the listener know this was my idea. And we're not just here to promote a book. We're here because there's a ton of value in these six steps for overall health and nutrition. And before we dive into each of those, Brian, what is your personal connection or experience that led to you developing these principles? Yeah, so the principles came about from my own personal experience along with working with clients. I mean, I don't think th- with these principles, there's nothing groundbreaking. I think mm-hmm. that's why they're sort of principles, right? You just like, getting back to the basics. It's like, I always equate everything to golf. It's like, you know, you can do all these fancy things, but it, a lot of it comes down to like, grip stance, you know, set up (laughs) and you know, same type of thing with health and fitness. I think it's easy to get caught up in a lot of the minutia or the details that go on, you know, if you're on YouTube or, or Instagram and and everyone's got a new tip of the day, but a lot of times that can can sort of take you farther away from your goal. I think so. That's why I wanted to sort of create this book, just sort of put it all together. I almost think it's like a workbook. Because mm-hmm. you sort of fill it out as you go and it gets you into act, taking action steps as opposed to just reading more information. Because there's plenty of information out there. People can find that as much as they want. Yeah. I mean, two two great things you mentioned there. One is the idea that they are principles. I'm um, a big fan of principles versus methods. I mean, we need methods at some point to take that action, but the principles never change. And you're right. The uh, 1% is where so much attention is paid, especially on social media. It gets the clicks you know, the cold plunges, the red light therapy, Um, even things that we think are kind of ho-hum, like supplementation still are are just that tiny percentage of what moves the needle. So it's it's great that you got to that point. But but I I did want to dig in a little bit more personally with you. I'm not asking, hey, what is your story? You know, people can learn about you. And (laughs) I don't want to take half the podcast doing that. They want to get the information. But like ser- seriously, like what, what what have you gone through? What have you learned? What's the hard knocks that you've experienced that got you to hey, this is important for me to put out in the world. Maybe it's helped you, it's helped clients. What say you on that? Well, it's, it's interesting because my journey through health started as a trainer and just sort of coaching and strength training. Nothing around nutrition, meal timing, things like that. 
sleep, stress, things that we'll touch on today. And I think the one thing I learned from that is, is like, I mean, resistance training is a big piece of the puzzle, but a lot of times with individuals, especially a lot of my clients, which are men that are 40 plus, you have to sort of dig a little bit deeper and touch on other aspects because they're all sort of intertwined. And I, I love resistance training and talking about that, but also realize that for people to get optimal results, they're going to have to maybe focus on other things alongside resistance training to really get what they want. So I think that was sort of my big thing that has grown through the years because I just first started out doing one thing and now I try to touch on all those different principles to help people get you know optimal health. Cool. Yeah. And I, I, that's probably why it appeals, especially to, you know, to guys like me and a lot of our listeners here. Um, I think we have very similar audiences from what I can tell when I was on your show, because the over 40 crowd is is growing and it's the demographic where we've got issues that catch up with us in life, right? We've got our personal obligations and our life stress. We have recovery and joint health challenges. A lot of people in the age group may not have started until late in life, but now you can't just say, yeah, go lift weights. There, there's all these synergistic um, things that go along with that. So, mm. all right, great. Thank you for setting the context. And let's dive right in. I think I have the six steps lined up, the first one being clarity. And that's an interesting one to start with. How do you find clarity? What does that mean? Why is this the first step in your step ladder? Oh, well, I mean, I think that a lot of times people want to go from like A to Z in like, 2.5 seconds and just get to where they want to go without necessarily digging into why they want to get there. I know like was it Simon Sinek? Sinek talks yeah. About, yeah, Sinek who's done a bunch of, you know, TEDx's and things talks about like, you know, his the why. And I, I think it's important about, you know, health as opposed to and along with other er areas of your life, but like getting crystal clear on that and you know, having, you know, sort of complete awareness of any like unconscious patterns that aren't serving you and that have hindered your progress in the past. So I think if you create some clarity as to, you know, why you want to get to where you want to go and, and then understanding what has not worked in the past, I think that's like a good first step to start with. And a lot of times that could be coming, coming down to, and I think we talked about it with you on my podcast is sort of recording like and understanding and tracking what you're already doing or what you're not doing. And then in sort of assessing that and then building a sort of a, a program from that. So by clarity, again, we're talking about not only your goals, as you just mentioned, but also what is maybe shouldn't be part of your goals or the unconscious patterns from the past that have sabotaged you from reaching your goals. And, and that's always an interesting one, right? Because I don't know if you've found this in your career, but early on for me, I was surprised at how much mindset played into this, even though I shouldn't have been. I think that was one of my unconscious uh, patterns is not realizing how much my own mind was holding me back. And a lot of people are in that situation where I just want to know what to do. Just just tell me the steps. Just tell me what I need to do. I'll get it done. I'm an action taker. And yet it doesn't quite, it's not the whole piece of the, the puzzle. So the tracking and awareness is great, but give us some more ideas underneath that as to not only finding your why, because I don't think that has to be too complicated, to be honest, but especially the what hasn't worked piece of that. Yeah. How you perceive yourself. I think it's important as well. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just give an example. Like I had a client, so I talked to him every week. He would always portray himself as a, like a fat guy. Like he, he, you know, he, he was repeating this, like this fat, funny guy. Right. And this is how he's perceived himself. And I think that I'm not saying you have to do some whole psychological analysis on people, but I do think it's important. These, these little things that you say to yourself, on a daily and weekly basis, they mean something and they could affect how you're going about getting to where you want to go. Because if you're always portraying yourself as that in your mind, consciously or unconsciously, this is going to take a toll over time. And, and, th and that's not to say that everyone is like that, but I think it's important to be aware, like the self-awareness, I think is, is a good sort of first step and how you portray yourself is important. And what, what is one of your favorite exercises or ways to reflect on that and learn about that self-talk in, in the context of what we're going for here, which is, you know, fitness specifically, because we could open up a whole can of worms. Uh, I remember early in my career as an engineer, getting a career counselor who had me do uh, one of those assessments, right? Those personality assessments. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of uh, do some other exercises that help you reflect on what you're good at, what you're not, what you like, what you don't like. 
And then you develop this sense of self-awareness. Other training I've had over the years has to do with communicating with others and having emotional intelligence. So we're really talking about the self here and the unconscious patterns and what's held us back. Also, the self-identity you mentioned of identify as a fat guy or identify as you know the, the class clown. Um, I'm trying to unravel this. What's a very practical strategy someone can do today who's listening to discover that for themselves? Well, I would say that writing down like in a journal, uh, I know not everyone like loves doing that. I mean, I literally write in my journal every morning and it takes me two and a half minutes. Like I, it, I'm waiting for my tea to boil. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like I'm sitting down writing a novel. So I think, and I, in, in that I write down, I self reflect and I write down who, who I believe I am. Like I'm a winner, you know, I'm gonna have health and happiness, you know, certain things that just are, it might be basic things, but like, you know, like I was just uh, not to go off, but I just watched a, a four part documentary on Conor McGregor oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and I can't say I'm like the biggest McGregor fan, but you can, you, what you learn from that is his mindset from the start was there was no doubt in his mind where he was going and, and who he, who he was and who he was going to become. And you see that. And I mean, he, obviously his work ethic is second to none and he, you know, but like there wasn't any doubt, you know, there wasn't any, and I'm not saying people can't have doubt and insecurity. I mean that everyone has that, but I think that if you feed yourself with sort of that right mentality, that, that winner mentality that you're going to get to where you want to go or who you, who you want to be, I think that does play a role. And I, you know, a lot of men don't necessarily, and even women don't want to necessarily even go down that road. But I think, you know, if you write a few things down, I would say those would be write a few things down of, of, of who you will believe you're, you're going to be, whether you're that person right now or not. I think that can take you far. And he had, he has like three kids now, but his first son, every, every time, every scene with his son called him a champ, you know, and that, that's going to work on the subconscious mind. And, and, you know, I'm sure with that, he might, end, his kid might end up becoming a champ who knows, but anyways, so that, that would be something that I would advise. I think that's great, man. I mean, people know who listen to me. I'm not, I personally am not a big journaler as a, as a actual tool, but I, I do love it for a lot of people. And I also do what you're doing. Positive affirmations, whatever you want to call them, you can do them verbally. You, you do them when you talk and write to people. You do them on the podcast. when you It's like, how are you communicating? And you kind of check yourself the more you do it because it's a skill like anything else. You develop yeah. that skill of saying, no, I'm an athlete. I'm a winner. I'm, I'm going to get bigger muscles. Like I'm going to take care of my kids. Whatever it, the thing is, it doesn't matter, but it's positive. It also reminds me of something in positive psychology called optimism bias. Some people have this inherently and, and some people develop it. Uh, the idea of just being optimistic about everything and not being afraid that the optimism is going to lead to disappointment, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're thinking, well, if I'm optimistic about everything and it doesn't turn out to be true, won't I be disappointed? It actually doesn't seem to work that way. It seems to shift everything toward you now taking actions to make that happen. And sometimes you fail and that's okay, but you're always pushing in that direction. Man, we're getting philosophical, Brian. Thanks for bringing that out. <laughs> I mean, I like, I like talking about this part. Like I always bring everything, like I said, back to golf and you see that with golfers, G good, bad, some of the greatest golfers, but the great ones, they think they already in their minds believe that they're, they're great. And there's no doubt they don't, you know, you hear a lot of people on the golf course say, well, I suck at putting. And they say that to themselves and they'll say it out loud because I coach high school golf. And I tell them, I said, you know, as much as you think that's not harming you, it actually, you're saying that to yourself every day. Like, is that really going to serve you? In the long term, it's not. So true. Yeah. And I tell my clients all the time, you're an athlete, you know, even if they don't want to admit, admit it or accept it. And sometimes you need someone else to kind of push you toward that. Like you yeah. said, with the, the golf example, Arnold Schwarzenegger is another great example of that. I mean, you watch his documentary, you see, he's oh, always dude, that was great. Like that. I, I, I love, I love that <laughs> a one, good one, the three part series with yeah. him. And I think people do it, sub, they don't realize they're doing it, right? Right. right. They don't realize they're saying, I, I suck at putting. And until someone makes them aware of that. So I think, you know, that's where a coach or someone can come into play and say, well, you realize you're saying that to yourself, like every time you go on the golf course. Well, yeah. And, and even to add to that, like just statements you make in general, when they are framed in a moral, moral way, like, like when we talk about food or just your week. You know, when I hear clients say like, I did bad or I did a bad thing, it's like, no, no, this is a reframing opportunity, right? Like mm. you made a choice, something happened, that's data, let's learn from it, let's move ahead. And this, this week you're going to be proactive and do something positive to shift it. Okay. So that, that's, that's the clarity piece. I don't know if you want to, you know, 
add anything else. I don't want to like robotically go to the next one if we're not there yet, but we can. <laughs> Number two. No, no, that's fine. I mean, the only thing I would add is like understanding where you're at. And I'll, I'll say I've talked about this before, meaning like set a baseline, like, okay, maybe, you know, like we talked about, like, well, we haven't talked about it yet, but we might've talked about my podcast is like a DEXA scan or like something where you just know where you're at at this point in time. Because if you can just make, you know, I think getting small wins, which is the next sort of pillar, I like to talk about it. I call it like small changes, big results, where you try to get these small wins that sort of give you these big results. And I think it's important to get those wins. Well, in order to get wins, I mean, we all, I think it's important to know where you're at now. So you can sort of understand like, okay, well, I've improved in these areas and I agree. I agree. Yeah. Getting a baseline and having objective data and getting the wins and celebrating all good, all good stuff. People need to hear this. All right. So let's, let's move on to step two, which I think is stress, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. These aren't in any particular order. I mean, the clarity one sort of is, but the, these re- the rest of them aren't necessarily in any order. I think it depends on the person. So some people are very good at managing stress. So we don't necessarily need to touch on that. But if someone's not, this is definitely a, um, a pillar that's going to be, you're going to want to hit right away because stress is something that everyone has. It's just about managing it. And I think how to manage stress is maybe different for everybody. But I think if you can create quality routines around your life, I think that can help you manage it. So Yeah. Okay. So let's dig into some of what you mentioned from a context perspective, because you said, you know, we can't reduce stress. We can only manage it. And I know what you mean. I did an episode recently. It was all about stress and talking about chronic life stress, how there's so much out of your control. And as the Stoics would say, like, who cares? Let's let's, let's control what we can. Like, mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. And, and of course, you can change your situation that's causing the stress and then reduce the stress. But most people are going through life with big things that are not easily changeable, you know, today or this week, like they have kids or, you know, they have this this particular job or live in a certain place. So before we understand how to manage it, why is it so important? I mean, you know, I probably have talked about it on this show many times, but from a weight management, hormones, well-being, like what are the big reasons that we care about chronic stress on health? Well, I mean, first of all, if you're in a fight or flight stress mode, like in the majority of your time, you know, that's going to obviously raise cortisol. And cortisol is both can be a positive and a negative. And it sort of goes in a di- diurnal state, like meaning diurnal uh, rhythm throughout the day. Right. So we'll have a little spike in cortisol in the morning and then it should slowly taper off towards the evening. And I uh, recently worked with a company called FDN where we do uh, like a saliva test and we see these diurnal rhythms based on different individuals and, and, and where their stress is at throughout the day. Sort of pretty cool in the morning, midday, and evening. And, and then you have a sum from that. A lot of times, if you go get blood work, it'll give you a sum. But um, I think what's important to understand is sort of that rhythm of cortisol and, and how it interacts throughout the day and, and goes up or down. But yeah, I mean, obviously, we're going to hold on to fat. And if our cortisol is, our high, cortisol is high all day, and so we have to sort of manage that as best as possible. And I think most importantly, understanding like you need to have your own self-care and take care of yourself. I think especially the audience that I talk to is 40 plus. A lot of times, you know, they're busy with their jobs and their kids and they don't give time for themselves in self-care. And you have to find time throughout the day for that, whether that's early in the morning, later at night, whenever it is. I always pr- tell people, you know, it, there's not a perfect time, but it's the time that you can do consistently for yourself. And whether that's 15 minutes first thing in the morning or later on, it, I think that, you know, prioritizing that is really important. I agree. And I also know that that's an area that I'm always improving because people who are tend to be (laughs) go-getters also tend to prioritize, you know, getting stuff done over a quote unquote self-care, quote unquote stress. And there's also this misconception that you need to do some advanced mindfulness or meditation techniques or yoga or something like that. So let's, let's dispel that and make it very simple and practical for people who are stressed and don't want to get stressed out by a stress relieving uh, technique. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what, are, what are, what are like, what's the entry point? What's the step ladder to <laughs> stress reduction techniques? Well, I'll tell you this. I am a yoga fan, but I don't necessarily think everyone is into yoga and I'm and a lot of my clients aren't. But I think if you can find like, I'll do five minute meditation in the morning. So if you can find five minutes, 
and start with that. I think that's a good place to start. And you can use an app. You can just sit in silence. I think that's not a, not a bad place to start, really. And, and you know, everyone can find five minutes. So I think that's a good place to start. I mean, I don't think it has to be anything groundbreaking. It doesn't have to be an hour class. But, you know, nowadays, there's plenty of apps, Headspace, whatever, the et cetera. There's a lot of them that sort of can guide you through that and at least give you just some time for yourself where you can just sit in your thoughts a little bit. All right. So the way I worded the question, I always word my questions a little bit in a little bit of a leading fashion, sometimes unconsciously. But when I said uh, advanced techniques like meditation, that's that's a form of um, self-talk or assumption that I'm using, right? By saying it that way. And what you just said was, hey, stop making excuses, bro. Like not just me, but everybody listening. Mm. It just takes five minutes. You can use an app, get it done. You just sit and be quiet. You know, in the morning, oftentimes I go straight to my phone. I want to get all the notifications out of the way, right? Because it just annoys me. <laughs> I would say turn off your notifications. Y- yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, right. I don't mean they wake me up, but you know, when you right. yeah. when I wake up, I check my email and stuff like that. But um, you know, not doing that and just taking five minutes to just sit is great advice. Okay. Would you consider activities that you're already doing for other things health related, like strength training, walking? Do those still fall in the category of stress management or do they have to be done a certain way to sort of count in that regard? No, I would say that counts for sure. Um, I mean, yeah, there's no doubt that lifting is a stressor, but it also can help relieve stress as well, right? <laughs> so it's a big irony there. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so I think it works both ways. You know, it's, if you only have a certain amount of time in your day, you got to sort of prioritize, you know, what you need most. And if you want to be efficient and you got, 20 minutes to 30 minutes and you know you rather not use some of that on meditation then maybe you do something active going for a walk or or lifting last question about stress you mentioned your well your journaling and your meditation do you ever have a time when the stress ramps up due to some acute activity that happens or you know some situation happens right or you see this with clients and then is there can there be a go-to activity or something you go to shortly thereafter to kind of bring that stress down there we go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you're talking about something that can just be done anywhere, right? Like, you know, if you're in the car or if you're somewhere, it's like sometimes you just need like something to fall back on. And I actually had uh, a gentleman, his name's Avi Greenberg. He's from New York. He works with individuals and coaches them on how to breathe. Just breathe correctly, focus on that. And I did some sessions with him actually after I interviewed him. They were like 45 minutes long and we he, literally, it was like a Zoom call based on breathing. And you're like, oh, well, that doesn't sound, but it was like at the end of the call, you know, I just felt a new, like enlightened and less stress and everything. And I mean, so breathing is like this underrated thing that you can really dive deep into it. And, and I'm not saying you have to do like Wim Hof breathing, but, you know, breathing in through your nose even out through your mouth. I think, you know, nose breathing obviously is huge, becoming bigger and bigger now, like these mouth tape companies. But like, right. you know, you got a, your best filters in your nose. And so I think it's important to focus on that. But yeah, if you just need something go to, you know, you, is I would just say focusing on breath. Yeah, that's a good one. We, we did a session with, um, so Alan, he's in our community, did an ost- alternate nostril breathing session. Okay. You know, that, that was very interesting because you get that flow through, through into one nostril out the other and it almost it's almost like a neti pot of air so to speak you know, yeah it kind yeah. of flows through it's very nice shout out to Felipe. i know Philip for a long time and i know how passionate he is about healthy eating and body strength and that's why i choose him to be my coach i was no stranger to dieting and body training but i always struggled to do it sustainably Philip helped me prioritize my goals with evidence-based recommendations while not overstressing my body and not feeling like I'm starving. In six months, I lost 45 pounds without drastically changing the foods I enjoy. But now I have a more balanced diet. I weight train consistently, but most importantly, I do it sustainably. If a scientifically sound, healthy diet and a lean, strong body is what you're looking for, uh, Philip Pape is your guy. All right, so then the next one, which is often tied together or related in many ways to that in terms of recovery, is sleep. I think we know sleep is critical. Everyone emphasizes that point, And yet I still feel and I see with clients that it's extremely, you know, we're under rested when it comes to sleep, both in terms of quantity and quality. 
and it affects a lot of things in our life. So tell us, tell us more about that. Yeah. I mean, sleep, gosh, I mean, we could talk an hour on sleep as far as improving, in, you know, insulin sensitivity, glucose metabolism, helping prevent weight gain. And one of the big things is also that can affect sleep digestion. And I think sort of like, I like to try the action steps for people that sort of hit a lot of different things. And, and, that, and one of those things is making sure that you give yourself enough time to digest and you eat early enough in the day. And you're seeing studies come out like this chrononutrition where if you've consumed most of your meals before a certain time, how that, and you're, and you're allowed to digest and metabolize food earlier in the day, this can help on a number of fronts that I've already, you know, insulin sensitivity, but glucose metabolism, and just helping quality of sleep. I want to stay with that because I, I feel like I've heard that three other times on podcasts just this week. And I want to emphasize it because coincidentally, I had a big dinner with a group you know, a couple nights ago and I, I posted like on, on social some graphs of my, um, you know, my weight trend, but also my HRV and my resting heart rate. And, you know, it was like 6, 7 p.m. It wasn't super late, but it was, hu- it was huge. It was like a 2000 calorie dinner. I mean, for me, that's, you know, pushing it. And so I slept through the night, but I didn't feel well rested. My HRV dropped. My resting heart rate went up, right? And it was like a significant variance from from the norm. And I posted that to show people like, here's the effect of eating too much close to dinner because you're just digesting the heck out of it through the night. I've also heard protein, you know, almost like protein itself because it takes more energy to digest, kind of shifting that earlier in the day, even though all us muscle heads are like, no, we got to get protein six times a day, right? Mm-hmm. That and then the the drinking, not drinking too close to bed. So I'm glad you're bringing that up and I want people to hear this because that alone is kind of a simple change to impact sleep quality. What is your recommendation on that? Recommendation as far as like, I would say establishing a time to cut off your eating window. You know, I used to be pretty big, like intermittent faster. I've cut back a little bit on that because I found I wasn't consuming enough for my like activity level and where I wanted to go get with goals within the, in the weight room and, and things like that. So but one rule I've always stayed with was cutting off the time that I'm done eating. I'm not saying I do this like we were just on vacation and you know we did eat early. We my wife luckily my wife likes to eat early too. So mm-hmm. we you know we eat with the senior citizens around like 5:30ish and and when in families that have kids. So if you could cut off that and give yourself 3 to 4 hours to digest food, um I think that can help quality of sleep and we all know, you know, s- sleeping will help with repair, muscle growth, and, you know, obviously releasing growth hormones that aid in, in both of those things. So the biggest thing I would say, first and foremost, is picking a time. For me, it's typically 6.30 to 7. I like to be done eating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and drinking too, or just, just eating? Um, I'll, I'll drink maybe, you know, I used to be big into tea later, but I found that I was, it, that was getting me up because I was peeing in the middle of the yeah, night yeah. a lot. Yeah. So I would say ideally both would be great. Yeah. Occasionally I'll have like, I don't know, carbonated water. You know, maybe I might have something a little bit later on, uh, but I try not drinking as well. I think that, yeah. yeah, both would be great. I think that's a great technique. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, just like you, when you have guests on, like it's, it's almost like a selfish, like a coaching call in a way, cause I'm getting all these techniques and thinking about my own routine. And I don't know how many people listening are, are snacking close to bed. And, you know, besides the, whether or not that serves your goals or not. Like for me, I could eat a lot because of I'm building muscle. And so sometimes I just don't have enough food, even when I'm done with dinner and I just eat at like 8 PM and then I go to bed at 9 30. Yeah, <laughs> and know. it's like, I'm used to that because it's not a lot. But then I wonder if I just experiment with, you know, stop at seven after dinner and do that for a week and see what happens. You know, it's good advice. It's, it's a great rule of thumb. Honestly, it's probably one of my top ones out of everything. I love it. Okay. That's a really good tip. Okay. So moving on. Uh, nutrition. We've touched on it a little bit. Um, you and I talked about it a lot last time and your, your podcast is kind of you know, predicated on that given the title, but let's go with your principles and your philosophy overall, just so the audience knows where you're coming from. Yeah. So, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a loaded question, yeah, but geez, like, okay. are you okay, a keto so, zealot? No. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I think my principles have like changed through the years. I was low carb for a while, a little bit like you, I think, right? You went through sort of different stages of trying different things. But I think first and foremost is sort of for every individual, it's like a sort of a self-experimentation stage for everybody to try different ways of eating and sort of finding what works. I think it's important 
because you're going to hear different opinions about a balanced view, about a carnivore, about you know a vegetarian. And I think for me, it's it's changed. I, I'm trying to consume more now, and I think that comes back to saying, okay, well, let's track, right? Let's understand what we're eating and how much we're eating, and then from there, just figuring out what works. Like one of the things I've used for myself is and realized is my second meal a day, I find I don't, I don't need much, you know, like I'll have a decent breakfast, which I used to not have. And I don't have that like first thing, but let's say nine, 10 o'clock, decent amount of protein, maybe some fruit, yogurt, something like that. And then my second meal, I find that I don't need as much. And then my third meal is maybe a touch on the, is like the main meal, but I'm having that earlier. So I have time to digest it. And that is, that's what, where has worked for me. So for most clients, I don't try to push one way or the other as far as like a certain style of eating. I think it's important to, you know, I know you're big into sort of this flexible eating where it's not necessarily about being perfect, but it's just about being sustainable for the long term. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of like carnivore, this carnivore craze come. And I think a lot of these quote unquote like diets work for a lot of people because one, it's taking them off sort of that standard American diet and, and getting them away from a lot of foods and, and ultra processed things that aren't serving them very well and going to a, more of a whole foods diet where it's creating satiety, which I think is really important. I had um, uh, Marty Kendall. I don't know if he's been on your mm-hmm. podcast. Marty Kendall, he does a lot of great writing around satiety and how if you can sort of lead with that, I think that can really help sort of balance your day and make it so you don't have to feel like you're over consuming and, you know, getting your arms around satiety is not easy, but, you know, for most people, if, and a lot of times that's obviously prioritizing protein, but there are a lot, certain carbs, even like potato that are, yeah. have, have been shown to be highly satisfying and sort of keep you from snacking all throughout the day. And so leading with that, I think is really important and wrapping your arms around satiety is a good sort of place to start. Yeah, I mean, in the intro, I said we're we're kindred spirits. There's definitely a lot of this we we agree on, and because we're agreeing on principles, we're not we're not you know dicking around with specific protocols because there is no specific protocol for any anybody. It, it's individual, and the idea of self experimentation. You know, I had never thought of the fact that all the diets I had tried, and you know, my clients tried, and women try 120 diets in their life on average, something like that. Really. Um, wow. it's, it's huge. It's, it's vastly more than what men cycle through just from what I've understood. We can now reframe those as positive experiences that taught us about ourselves. I like mm-hmm. that, right? Mm-hmm. I have a lot of clients now coming off of carnivores, I'm going to call it, <laughs> <laughs> who, who said, look, I, I liked all the food and I love to eat meat and eggs and you know butter. I felt great after I switched to it and I got some decent results but I just couldn't stick with it. And that's, and that was the big sticking point was the sustainability piece. And you'll, you'll see all these arguments about some of these diets, like, well, no, you know, all the short term blood markers and health markers all look great or better or this and that. And, uh, it's kind of taken out of context. Like you said, with well, well, you're changing about 50 variables when you switch from the standard American diet to any other diet. Mm. So let's pick the best thing that works for us. Satiety also totally agree that that is huge, especially during especially during fat loss, right? When you have less calories to to make it easier. But even when you're not, you can get hungry even when you're building, right? Mm-hmm, <laughs> and mm-hmm. satiety leads to, like you said, cho- choosing protein, choosing fiber, choosing you know nutrient dense foods. Anyway, I- I'm just commenting all the stuff you said because it's good. Well, and you know one one thing I'll say that when I was doing some more fasting, what it, what it taught me to understand about my body was like true hunger, what that was. Because I, what I've noticed going back to consuming more and eating like to say, say three whole meals is I'm craving more, which not necessarily is a bad thing. But when you do do bouts of fasting, you sort of, I think you sort of get in tune with your hunger cues and like understand that like a lot of times your body's just going to, it's a creature, you're a creature of habit, right? So if you're used to eating at these times, your body's going to give you these cues to eat then. And I think sometimes it's good to just mix it up and just say, okay, what would happen if I just skip a meal and mm-hmm. how do, how would I feel? And like just understanding and being more self-aware of like your hunger as opposed to just being, okay, I'm just going to eat the second I get like this urge to eat. And you just sort of lose t- in touch of, of, of what really is 
what really is hunger and what's just sort of your body being used to eating all day long. Yeah. And I wonder how long it takes to get to true hunger because I've never done more than like a day and a half fast. Have you done like three day fasts? You know, I was never, uh, yeah, never a big long term one. But yeah, something like you. I, I, I at t- times I did like a, a day and a half to two in that range, never really much more than that. And, you know, I don't necessarily advise it for most people, but just at least if you have never done it, at least sort of give yourself some space between meals. <laughs> I think it's important unless you're like you're really in a building mode and you want to eat yeah. like six times a day. But if you're not, you know, giving yourself space between meals. And then I like to call it like, like almost like bumper, like, you know, what is it? Bumper bowling where you got the, the on each side of the. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, the so, bumpers, yeah. yeah <laughs> what's it? Yeah. Bowling with bumpers. It's just eating with bumpers, right? Don't eat too close to bedtime and don't eat the second you get up. Like I like to start with those sort of like just uh, rules of thumb right off the bat. And then you can sort of adjust it as you, as you go. I mean, that's another good tip in there is to schedule your, to schedule your meals, at least come up with a routine and have those, you know, quote unquote, we call them rules, but they're really just your own guidelines that work for you. You mentioned with the fast, what was I going to say there? Oh, what? <laughs> it's just a funny thing that came to mind. Like a colonoscopy is like a forced one day fast oh, <laughs> when sure. you have to prepare for it. So <laughs> take advantage of that if you're over 40 and, uh, or actually, I guess it's 50, but I- I've had mine earlier. But anyway, the fasting, I heard something recently about how a lot of us, myself included, when I've done these one-day fasts, it's been a long time. I can't even imagine doing them anymore, but I used to do them regularly, like once a week, where you get this scent, you get a little bit of hunger that, that's not kind of, you realize it's not real hunger, right? Your body says, okay, you're not feeding me, turns off the hunger signals. And then you get this sort of clarity, this interesting <laughs> clarity that you get. Now, I did hear something recently that they've studied that phenomenon and found that, that part of that is, is pure perception. It's like a pure mental thing, really, okay. which is interesting. Um, which I guess it doesn't matter, right? If you perceive it that way, it is that way sure. for you. But but anyway, I, I just I'm going off on a tangent because there you can learn a lot from fasting, is what you're saying about not only hunger but other things too about your uh, yourself, including what do you do with yourself when you're not constantly eating, right? Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. You don't realize how much uh, it takes up of your of your day, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a good tool, right? I think it's a tool. You know, for example, I just came back from traveling. We were on the plane, didn't really want to eat like plane food or airport food. So, you know what? It's a decent time to do a little bit of fasting, uh, nothing crazy. But, you know, th- I think if you can sort of look at and find times where you're going to be around food that's not going to serve you, you can use those times as, as good sort of testing times to, to the fast a little bit. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. It, if, if anybody is used to getting into that flow state where you're working and you just, time goes by, you you can go hours and hours and hours without eating and not being hungry. And you realize it is, it's more of a habitual thing than a, uh, re, a hormonal thing. Is there any, anything else about nutrition? You know, cause again, a lot of what we're going to say, the audience has probably heard <laughs> from me too, yeah. but myths or hot topics or anything going on these days, it's like top of mind that you wanted to share. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of myths. I, probably that been been debunked eventually but you know i think there was a recent one regarding protein distribution throughout the day oh yeah the 100 gram study yeah yeah so i don't know if you touched on that i haven't yet i mean not on the the show itself it's a good one did you want to talk about it uh you know it's funny i was just looking through it i i I probably don't know enough to sort of comment on it but to the listeners uh yeah there was um a recent study done on what was it testing like protein distribution throughout the day and whether it it matters, you know, if you have a certain amount for each meal, right? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and it measured, I believe, like 25 grams versus like 100 grams. Yep. Versus uh, zero. Yeah. Versus zero. Yeah. So I can't say I'll comment too much about it because I haven't gone through it all. But what I, what I think the conclusion was, was the fact that you can consume more protein than you think and your body will, will be able to handle it and not necessarily just like not absorb, I guess. I don't know. I, I'd ha- I have to look a little bit more into it. Did, did, did you? Uh, yeah. yeah, I did. I, I didn't want to take away your thunder, but, yeah, but go ahead. since you brought it up, we might as well. Like, I actually coincidentally went to a, a live training that Bill Campbell did last night. Oh, um, his, okay. bo- his Body by Science review that sure. his um, subscribers get access to these things. And he talked about the exact things. If, if I hadn't seen that, I, I'd know less about it. What they found is from zero to 25 grams, you get like 25% more muscle synthesis. From 25 to 100 grams, you get another 30%. 
And so there's no upper limit is what they've, what they've determined to how much protein you have in one bolus and one meal. Uh, and the prosprandial, as they call it, muscle protein synthesis simply extends longer and longer the more protein you have. That's, that's it. And past studies that looked at like 20 and 40 grams actually were in line with this. It's just that they were kind of misinterpreted. And some of the studies didn't look past like a couple hour window. So we didn't know. But yeah. So the conclusion is like, get your total protein and how you distribute it almost doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Which is which good, is, right? It's good. Yeah. Which, you know, for people who, and not, not to say that I'm a big fan of like one or two meals a day, for some people it works they can consume a decent amount of protein and, and, and their body will be able to util, utilize it as opposed to thinking they have to eat it six times a day or four times. Four times a day was sort of, I think, with some of the protein experts out there, I think that was like sort of the ideal yeah. amount of meals for growth. What yeah. I, I mean, if, you, if I went back in time a year ago, that's what I would have been saying. Like, nah, you got to eat maybe four or five times a day to get the optimum, you know. Right. Not really. Not really. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. That's a great example you brought up of the science just evolving and, and the evidence, you know, taking us in the right direction. It's good. So the next one on your list of the six, six principles, we're up to number five now is meal timing, which is, hey, look at that. Good segue. We were just talking about meal timing. <laughs> so, um, I mean, meal timing can influence a lot of things, but I also wonder if some people, you know, put it above other things that are more important, like getting total protein. But what are your thoughts on meal timing? Why is it important? And so on. Well, I think one of the things, and we talked, touched on it a little bit, is the fact that we're more insulin sensitive early in the day. And our muscles, which means our muscles are better able to absorb and utilize glucose as opposed to later in the day where we become less and less insulin sensitive. So I think that's an important thing to understand. I mean, I don't think it's like the end all. And if, if you have to eat, if you're working all day and you have to eat later, you know, it is what it is. But I think it's another sort of tool that if there's a day where you feel like you're going to have a bigger meal, perhaps you have that meal earlier on because your body's more insulin sensitive as opposed to eating that uh, later on in the day. But again, I don't necessarily think it's like the end all, but it's interesting research that's, that, that is around eating later versus earlier in the day. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and that's related to cortisol, right? And related to, um, so now we're also talking about carb intake. Is, there, is your general recommendation, again, knowing that this is maybe not a huge thing that moves the needle, just to shift your carbs earlier in the day? Yeah, I think if you're going to, yeah. Um, if you're going to eat, especially if you're going to eat like simple carbs or sweets, you know, you're better off eating them in the morning or early afternoon when you are more insulin sensitive than, than late at night. So <laughs> I don't think, uh, and I'm not necessarily anti-carb, but I think if you could just focus your carbs on, you know, like fruits, vegetables, maybe, you know, you know, boiled potatoes or something like that, I think, or even, you know, rice from white rice from time to time, I think, you know, that's a good uh, way to go about it as opposed to like the breads and the pastas and the pastries. You know, and if you're going to have those, have it earlier on. So have breakfast in the morning. But, you know, again, from that standpoint, I, you know, I, I had like Dr. Don Lehman on and he talked about the importance of getting that, that first meal to have be a high protein meal. So again, uh, we all know that protein is important. And if you can start the day with a higher protein meal, but also, you know, if you're going to have carbs, I'd probably have them in the middle of the day. No, you know, not too late. Yeah. I'm not going to show you my food logs, man. <laughs> you're going to see a lot of carbs in there. <laughs> yeah, hey, um, no, no, I mean, I'm not, not, not anti-carb. No, I know sure. you're not. I, I, I know yeah. you're not. Uh, some of the foods you mentioned though. Yeah. I, I like all the carbs. Let's just put it that way. Just every type is, is a friend of mine. Um, oh, okay. You know, other than, you know, added sugars, I'm not a huge fan of if you can keep those, those down a bit. Hmm. But uh, there's also a workout and training window aspect. Is, is that what, do you go into that as well in your, uh, in your book about meal timing that for training? Well, I would say that unless like you're trying to train or you're bodybuilding for a competition, I think the, the best time to work out is at what works for you. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a perfect time. I mean, I was just on vacation. I worked out mornings in the mornings because before the day got going because I wanted to get it done. And, you know, my wife was sleeping. So I just got it done then. And I was in a fasted state and the workouts were, you know, were solid. You know, when, when my normal routine is, is middle of the day workouts, but mm -hmm. again, whatever works, whatever is sustainable for the long term, 
when as far as working out, I think it's easy to get caught up in this, all these details around the perfect time to work out. But I think it's just the, the time that's, that's most consistent. Yeah, I, I would agree. It might change, you know, as, as your schedule changes. I used to work out in the middle of the day as well. And I work out in the morning. And it's funny because I'll hear arguments for different times of day. And even those don't agree. Like, well, work out at night because you get a little boost in performance, you know, because you're, I don't know why, but, you know, you've been up, your cortisol curve has dropped a bit, you're well fed, whatever the reason. But then at other research that says, well, no, if you do it in the morning, there's these huge mental health benefits that actually translate to the rest of the day and better nutrient utilization. And then it ends up making you perform just as well. <laughs> so it's like, just do what works for you. <laughs> That's where we get into the minutia going back to your opening, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Find the time that works. And even if it's a short the micro workout, I talk about micro workouts all the time. I think, mm. you know, you know, something's better than nothing. And I don't think you need to be in the gym for an hour and a half. Yeah, something's better than nothing. Well, so that segues to the last step, which is your uh, activity upgrade, you call it, which is an interesting term I want you to explain. But then we can get into micro workouts and effective training and, you know, for the older guys too, what what this all means. Yeah. You know, one of the things I found through like COVID was creative ways to to, to get the workout done and, you know, in your basement or in your home because everyone wasn't going anywhere. And so I think that these micro workouts sort of became started to get popular then. And I've had him on my podcast podcast a few times, Dr. Jake Wish. He has this X3 bar, which is cool. Like I got really into the X3 um, over COVID. Now I do it from time to time. It's not every workout. I do like traditional lifting as well. But one of the things I learned from doing that is, gosh, I would do, you know, short sort of upper body workouts and lower body workouts. I sort of split it like that. And and they weren't long workouts, but I found that I was building muscle. And uh, one of the things that I learned was also using resistance uh, bands was a little bit easier on the joints. And so I've implemented that with a lot of the uh, 40 plus year old individuals that I work with because, you know, I don't think everyone's meant to like necessarily, not everyone's meant to like bench press. I don't think. I think, especially as you get older, you know, it might be tough on the shoulders, the joints. And if you can find a, a better way to maybe utilize different tools in the weight room to help with joint integrity, I think you know resistance bands is something that I never used to use, and now I, I use it from time to time, and it's and it's effective. And that that's as consistent with your principle of the whole theme of this show, which is if you're not going to go into the gym and do a bench press, you might as well do something that's just about as effective. That's not a bench press. Like it's mm -hmm. the zero versus doing it and the, the shoulders and all, all these other connective tissues, people can, you know, people have issues with those and they have surgeries and, uh, it may be, they may have an injury or whatever. I've had shoulder surgery and I'm seeing how that affects different things. And you can get creative, you get different grips and uh, bars and whatnot. But right. I, I do, I used to be a little more dogmatic about dogmatic myself. And like you said, there's a, Many ways to roam, many, many roads to roam, so to speak, with this. You call it an activity upgrade. So tell me about that. I call it an activity upgrade. I guess that depends on the individual. Okay. But if this is someone that's coming from not doing much at all, obviously any activity will work. <laughs> you know, it'll it'll help. You know, I think that if it's someone that's more experienced, then it's then it's wrapping your arms around, you know, building muscle as you get older, which obviously can be more difficult, but I'm sure with you see with your clients and Andy Baker, who I've had on my podcast, talks about. I mean, really, you can build muscle. No matter. I mean, he has. I know he's got some clients that are really up there, and they're you know deadlifting and doing things that most twenty year olds can't do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it depends on the goal of the individual. But the upgrade is finding a way to get a time efficient workout in, so it sort of takes the excuses out, and that's one of the reasons why I like you know some type of like twenty minute workout that that we can establish so we'll try to build a routine in 20 minutes and you know they have to be efficient and it's maybe not like they're not like training to be a bodybuilder but they're just training to find a way to stay consistent and still build muscle in a short period of time i love it man so two two things came to mind now that you brought this up one is the idea of these short workouts i think i don't know if it was when i was talking to dr eric helms or who it was but the question often comes up, what can I split my workouts, for example? Like what if I do do want to do an hour long full body workout, but I just don't have the time and maybe I have a home gym because it's hard. You don't want to like drive to a gym twice a day usually. Mm. And the answer is not only yes, but hey, maybe it is slightly more effective to split your 
split split them up because you have better recovery and you can go all go all out in that second session. Whereas if it was on the second half of the first session, you'd be fatigued. Mm. So I wanted to point that out. It's it's great advice from a efficiency and performance perspective. But then also the time efficient workouts. Brian Borstein's coming on and he's a huge fan of intensity techniques. Mm. And when you talked about upgrading your activity, I thought, oh, that's it's a good way to think about like always improving and personal growth. Even if you are an intermediate lifter who does all those moves and you just want to keep getting better and you want to save time, what can you do? Right. And so like the mile reps and the drop sets and all that fun stuff comes into play. The point is, listen to what Brian's saying here and like, don't make excuses. There is something that will work for you, whatever level you're starting from. So mm. lo- love your message on that. Yeah. And I mean, in, as far as in improving, one of the things I've been doing a little bit more, which I never used to do, is log my workouts. Um, and we talked about that maybe on my podcast. And you know, you can use an app or you can write it in a journal. But I think logging helps. It sort of un- you understand sort of where you're at. I never used to do that. But then, like the next time you go into the gym, even if you increase it by a little bit, two and a half pounds, I know you can also increase it other ways, right? By by rep range and things like that. But just finding that variable that you want to increase. And I think it helps get you into um, like a healthy habit of just creating those wins when we talked about, right? Like it, it makes you feel a little bit, oh, the last time I did 185 10 times and now I just did 190 for 10 times, yeah. you know? And so I think those creating those small wins helps motivation and helps you coming back and sort of gets you going to stay consistent and, you know, improve every time. And people need to hear that. I, I still get questions like, oh, should I log my workouts? And I'm flabbergasted, right? Because I just t- assume that you're going to log your workouts. But I guess when you go back in time and think, you know, when you're in your 20s, going to the gym and just, hey, I'm going to do upper body today. And next time oh, I'm going to do lower body today, you weren't logging. You're missing out on a huge opportunity for for tracking your and measuring your outcome, like you said, and then improving, getting the win, getting motivated. Hey, look, I'm lifting 10 more pounds. I really want to go to the gym again to get another five pounds. Mm-hmm. Good stuff, man. All right. We're wrapping out on time here. So I do like to ask a question of all guests. And that is because we did go through your six pillars, your six principles. What one question did you wish I had asked? And what is your answer? <laughs> well, how about this? I ask everyone on my podcast, what one tip would you give that individual who's looking to get their body back or her mind potentially to what it once was 15, 20 years ago or 10 years ago? So I mean, I for me, I think a, a big habit that's really influenced my life in the most positive manner is daily walks. So simple. Everyone, for the most part, can do it. And I think it's a great way to get out in nature, you know, maybe get some sun if you're not in Chicago and you're somewhere <laughs> somewhere else where the sun actually comes out. But you still get sun even with the clouds, right? And we talk about your sort of diurnal rhythms throughout the day. You know, cortisol is one thing that you know, sort of starts higher in the morning and then it'll slowly drift it towards night. And I think getting up in the morning can help that um, and also help you with quality sleep. So morning walks, I love. If you can't, if the morning doesn't work, I always say your best bet next after that is walking after meals and um, help with blood sugar regulation and help with digestion. And it's just, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just something I have two dogs, so I'm sort of forced into that. But even when I go on vacation, I still do it. And it just got me into that habit of doing it, getting up and going, putting on your gym shoes. And so I like to find things that are that are sort of ex- excuse proof <laughs> and and do them. I love it. So. Yeah. And and you you even opened up the excuse people make about like if it's cold or, or whatever, embrace it. I, right. Like if people ask me that, they say, well, what do you do when it's a cold or rainy day? I said, well, why? What does that mean? You can't walk just because it's cold. Or rain. Throw on a nice big coat. You know, enjoy the freshness of it all and the smell of the rain or whatever, you know, like find a positive way to do that. If not, you're going to be walking around your house a lot. And that, that'll, that'll do the job too, I guess. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess that's, that would be a second. So I'm looking right now, I'm, I'm going to take my dogs out after this and I'm looking at it. It's, it's raining, but you know, we go. Most of the time, the dogs don't mind unless it's like really cold and then, the, and then their paws can't last a long time because of the salt and all that. But like, I mean, it's 40 and raining, you know, mm-hmm. you, you put some layers on, you put a hood on and you go. And it happen, uh, man. I think it's, and, and I think it just goes back to just the positive, like putting in positive habits and creating that positive momentum for the day, small wins. And like, I was just reading Limitless, Jim Quick, mm-hmm. and they, he just talks about even just like making your bed first thing in the morning, 
Like, okay, you just did something, right? Like that is creating momentum in a positive manner. Because, you know, I talk about this and there's another great book called, um, and I'm just drawing a blank, but time will either expose you or, or be on your side. And so it can be on your side if you, if you start doing positive things that, that'll, that'll serve you in your health. We'll, we'll leave it on that message. It's a, it's a great message, Brian. Um, I had a lot of fun talking with you today and I want the listeners to be able to find you. So tell us where they can learn more about you and your work. Best place is just briangrin.com, sort of the hub for everything. And yeah, I'm on Instagram at, uh, my handle has changed a bit, but it's brian underscore men's health is my Instagram handle. And uh, yeah, you can find everything, Step Ladder System, my book, it's all there both in PDF and in soft cover. Yeah, and I, I encourage everyone to check those out. I'll throw those in the show notes, BrianGrin.com or at Brian underscore men's health. And I'll even include the link directly to the stepladder system, make it easy for folks. And of course your podcast, Get Lean, Eat Clean. I'll make sure the link is right and uh, let people know. Thanks again for coming on, man. Bill, thanks for having me. I loved it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Wits and Weights. If you found value in today's episode and know someone else who's looking to level up their wits or weights, please take a moment to share this episode with them. And make sure to hit the follow button in your podcast platform right now to catch the next episode. Until then, stay strong. Hey, before you go, I want to let you know about a free resource I have. They are free guides on everything from fat loss to eating out to building muscle to managing hunger to figuring out the best macros for you and more being added all the time. You want to get the most out of these podcasts and your time to look and feel your best. And these free guides will give you a quick and easy way to know what to do. If you want to get your hands on these completely free guides, you can head over to witsandweights.com slash free. That's witsandweights.com slash free to get your free guides and level up your results today.